have Jared Yates Sexton, who's an author and political commentator from Linton, Indiana. He's an associate professor in the Department of Writing and Linguistics at Georgia Southern University. Today I'll be talking to Jared about his 2019 book, The Man They Wanted Me to Be, Toxic Masculinity and a Crisis of Our Own Making, where he explores his working class upbringing and his thoughts on what he calls America's traditional idea of masculine identity. Hi, Jared. Hey, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm really excited to talk to you about this topic. Uh, Men's Issues is one of my, um, I'm a private practice counselor, and uh, Men's Issues is one of my uh, specialties. So I think you and I could talk forever, but we only have a certain amount of time. (laughs) Well, I I have to say, I'm so glad that you're doing that. I mean, where I come from, we always say you're doing the Lord's work. Because, I mean, having... Helping men work through this stuff is both unbelievably necessary, but it's a it's a chore. Mm. It's an absolute chore trying to make it happen. So I'm really glad people are out there doing it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, before we dive into the book, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, how this book came to be. How did you get here? I know in the book you detail your story. Uh, and and how that kind of correlates to the toxic masculinity. Um, but I'd love for our audience to hear a little bit more about you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I sort of cut my teeth covering the 2016 presidential election. And I, I, you might remember I was like one of the people who was like sneaking into Trump rallies and talking yes. to the supporters and stuff. And in the midst of, of covering uh, the Trump phenomenon, what I started to come face to face with, um, you know, particularly because of the Access Hollywood tape and, you know, the, mm-hmm. the so-called locker room talk that we don't have to get into, um, I started to realize that there was a problem within America with not just toxic masculinity, but masculinity in general, that there, that, that there was something underneath the surface that we have not been dealing with that Mm -hmm. has now sort of metastasized in culture. And you now see it in things like, you know, extremist groups. You see it with incels. You see it with the alt-right. You see it with all of these different groups. But you also see a lot of men are, are living shorter lives. A lot of men are killing themselves. A lot of men are suffering from addictions and, you know, these debilitating, um, you know, diseases that could be prevented or could be treated. And I wanted to write about that, but I also needed to do something else, which was to talk about my own story. Mm. I grew up in a really, really poor, dysfunctional family where there was a lot of, of abuse and a lot of toxic masculinity. And I barely survived that myself. But what I found later on in my life is that what I had experienced there actually rubbed off on me and caused my own mental health issues and my own personal crises. And so I wanted to write a book that talked about what I had gone through, what I had learned, but also to sort of deal with what our culture is going through at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and I, I want to say it's. I found it to be really, really powerful when I was reading the book. Uh, you know, it, there was a lot that I resonated with. Um, and so, was it was it the going to the Trump rallies? Is that kind of what exposed you to your own the masculinity that you felt like you were kind of caught in, or where when did that happen for you? Well, you know, it, it, it's weird because there, there's a lot of different things that had occurred there. So, like, I actually thought that my whole sort of experience with masculinity and toxic masculinity was sort of left behind. So I write in the book that my, my father died at the age of 56, a really – from a from diabetes and these chronic illnesses that should have been taken care of. And I had watched my own dad go through a transformation. I mean, my dad was, um, you know, he was the hard Marine. He, 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 mm-hmm. he was very stoic and, and aggressive and at times abusive with his family. And I had always thought that there was something wrong with me. Because I was like a sensitive kid, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that sensitivity was met with physical, verbal, and emotional abuse at all turns by men who wanted me to be tougher. They wanted me to be more masculine or whatever. And what I ended up learning from my interactions with my dad, particularly later on in his life, was that he had been like that as well. And he had had that beaten out of him and yelled out of him and abused out of him. And I started realizing that, the masculinity that I thought had existed 
and was real, that there was something defective about me, is that that masculinity wasn't real at all. It was a total illusion that men hid behind. And the reason why men were abusive and violent and aggressive and, and all these problems that come with so-called toxic masculinity is because they were overcompensating for their own insecurities. Mm. And knowing that, eventually when the Donald Trump campaign and phenomenon started taking off, I started to realize that this wasn't just a problem that was going on in my life and in my family's lives, but that this was a national problem and an international problem, really, right? It's the idea that masculinity is an identity that was created for economic purposes mm. and for industrial purposes. And it actually is incredibly corrosive and toxic, not just to women and vulnerable populations, but to men themselves. And so we actually have a giant societal problem with masculinity that has held us back personally, economically, but also politically. Right, right. Yeah, there's, I, you know, some of the men that I work with, you know, and I've heard you say this, that they really struggle with interpersonal relationships. We have, uh, we find that a lot of times men have more surface level relationships with each other. We talk about sports, we talk about politics, but we don't really go underneath that. You don't hear a lot of men saying, oh, yeah, I had a fight with the wife and, you know, it's, uh, you know, well, how are you feeling well, about and, that? <laughs> right? Well, and the problem there, unfortunately, and, and I'm trying to remember the exact quote that I wrote about it in the book, but we end up becoming each other's jailers, mm. you know, because it's. If you actually and, – and it's been so long during the pandemic, I barely remember what it's like to go out and have a beer with a friend of mine. Absolutely. But, but I think most men can relate to this, that like the two men who go to a bar, right, and they sit next to each other at a bar and they watch a game on TV and like they sort of discuss the, the, the game or whatever. And then both of them are actually sitting there with one another terrified that they're going to be revealed as less than masculine mm. or they're going to be the less manly of the two. So they actually compete with one another to be the most stoic. And, and you bring up the interesting thing, which is, you know, you have a, you have a fight with your partner or something. You need to talk to somebody about it. Yeah. But men would immediately just throw out some like misogynistic, like, Oh, you know, women or whatever. And right. just sort of like, that opposition sort of apart. And the problem that happens there is that men take their problems and just swallow them down, but they don't go away. I mean, you know this. It, it Absolutely. Yeah. It eats away at a person. And what eventually happens, unfortunately, is you start out doing this stuff as a persona. Right. You do it because you're like, oh, I really hope that nobody figures out that I'm less masculine than they think that I am. And then eventually later on, there are these conditions where men become clinically detached from their emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a, a learned stoicism. It's a lived stoicism at that point. And this is one of the reasons why men live shorter lives and, and less happy lives, because they're lonely and they're in need of that outlet, but they can't have it because it would destroy their identity. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do want to jump into at some point talking about the term toxic masculinity because I think it's a really loaded, uh, for sure, loaded term. Um, but there is there's some real depth in what you're talking about when when we talk about how uh, men don't we hold it in we hold in the emotions and you know what that what that ends up creating is uh, an over overloaded sense of guilt or shame or you know and an anger right we know that uh the acceptable emotions for a man are typically uh being content being angry and being aroused right like it's that's about it for us um and that's pretty advanced for some men just right. Yeah. Those that's three. that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And there, th yeah, there are a, a lot of men that are that are taught to not even experience those. Right. But we know there is a there's a, a a whole array of emotions that are underneath those those emotions. And uh, so I'm wondering in your because I know that you've you've actually gone and done talks on the book and. And things like that. And uh, so I'm wondering if you've talked to any men who have had, uh, you know, have kind of seen seen something different out of, you know, reading the book or kind of had some aha moments 
or you know people who have changed uh, because of of learning this? I have to tell you the truth. When I started writing this book, and I think I think when you write a book, the first thing that should happen in your mind is to be terrified that maybe it might be nonsensical. Mm. Right. Because, you know, I, I, I truly believe that when you write a book, you're burying yourself for the world and hoping that somebody somewhere says, yeah, OK. You right. know what I mean? Like, yes. I, I see you. And, and, and there's actually a really good quote by a writer, uh, Jonathan Franz, and he said that all writers and readers are lonely and they're just trying to figure out if other people feel like them. Mm. Well, I wrote this book and to write this book, I had to admit, first of all, that, you know, I had felt less than the masculine ideal and that I had had insecurities and that I had behaved poorly as a way of overcompensating. And by the way, doing that in like the era of me too was really frightening as well. Right. Like talking about like what, like where have I fallen short and all of this? And it, it still is like, it was really, really terrifying. And I actually, I didn't know what to expect, but I have to tell you that when I started going around talking about this book and doing readings and doing interviews, I was really overwhelmed. Because what I found was that there were tons of men who came up and they said, I thought I was the only one who felt like this. Mm. And I thought that I was the only one who was insecure about this. And I thought that I was the only one who had ever worried about this. And then, weirdly enough, I started having a lot of uh, wives and sisters and cousins and daughters who would write and they'd be like, I never understood my dad or my husband or any of these people. And then the next wave was those women giving the book to those men. Mm. And I started talking to a lot of men who I think that they were really scared. And then they read about my dad dying. Right. And my dad had this miraculous turnaround. Like later on in his life, we had a big conversation where um, I sort of confronted him and I was like, you know, you know that this isn't real, right? And he was like, I've been waiting my whole life to hear that from somebody, right? Mm. That, that it's not real. And he fe- and, and all of a sudden we became really, really close. And I think when men particularly who were in their middle ages or so, you know, a little bit older, they read about that, they started reaching out to me. And then I started forming these really good relationships with a bunch of men who had not realized that they had been problematic or they didn't realize there was another way to be. So I started out really terrified that it would be, you know, it basically just land with a giant resounding thud that no one would be interested in. And it turns out that there were tons of men out there who, uh, who were similarly lonely. So Mm -hmm. I, I, it was rewarding in that, but I have to tell you, it was, this was an exhausting project to carry out and to put into the world. I can imagine it is really vulnerable to tell your story like that. And you do go into detail in, in your book about some of the, you know, some of the things that you did, you know, that, that kind of participated in that uh, toxic masculinity that, that we talk about, right. And your journey through it, that's, that's very vulnerable and powerful. And I, and so it doesn't surprise me that, men found some, uh, they found an opening in reading it, like, oh, okay, so this is what this is, right? It's, it, it's Well, and, and it is, it's, and it's one of those things, and I actually feel like, and, and it took me a while to sort of, um, it took a number of therapists for me to talk to, you know what I mean? Like, like because one of the problems, and I, I, I truly and honestly believe this, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time right now talking about the current political climate. Mm -hmm. I think we're in the middle of a political crisis. I think we're in the middle of a societal crisis. I think we're in the middle of an existential crisis. Mm. I also think we're in the middle of of a mental health crisis. Yeah. And, And I think that part of the problem is that so many men are, not just men, but people in general, but we're talking about the masculinity problem. I think so many men are stuck in confusion between the person that they think they are and the person that they actually are. And it's really hard to navigate between the two. And I've, mm. I've been trying to tell the people that I talk to about this book that it's not like I'm cured, right? Like I was raised up in a dysfunctional, abusive, patriarchal home. Mm-hmm. Like I still have so much healing to do. It's not like I wrote the book and put it out in the world. In fact, the book coming out put me in my own existential crisis, right? Having that all out there. And I wrote about, I wrote about the abuse that I went through as a child and that just opened up the wound. I had to then like, it was, it was so funny. I, by the way, you have a very nice 
way of bringing this out. I got to say, it's the therapist. That's very, very good. <laughs> but it was like one of those moments where I truly and honestly thought that writing the book would just solve it. Mm. Right. I would just digest it and it would be done. And then almost immediately as the book shipped out, I was like, I have to go talk to my therapist. Yeah. Like I need to make a, a meeting. And so what men need to understand, and I'm glad you brought up the, the term toxic masculinity, because this is something that we have to wrestle with. Right. We don't exactly have the vocabulary yet to really talk about this thing. Mm. To say that something is toxic means that there is the opposite, which is a completely healthy, healthy masculinity. There's really not. Yeah. The, the entire gendered idea of masculinity, there are good things about it and there are bad things about it. And it's a pendulum that moves back and forth. So I didn't escape it. You know, I, I thought I did when I was younger, but then it caught back up with me. And now it's just a constant thing to keep an eye on. But I think men can understand, hopefully, that there are going to be times where they're better and there are going to be times where they're worse. And that is um, that's a hopeful thing. I yeah. think, to yeah. understand that, that you're not either cured or diseased, I guess you would say. Absolutely. And, the, you know, the same goes with femininity, right? It's it, yep. it, There are there are good and bad and, and all that we have. And you talked about how there is such a kind of a storied history of masculinity in America. And it's the same for femininity. And we have these um, as... Uh, Dan Griffin talks about the man rules, and then we have the, I think there, I forgot the, the guy's name, but he talks about the man box, where we're kind of held in this box of these rules that we don't really know to talk about, but you can all, we can all name some of them, right? right. We're not, not supposed to cry, we're not supposed to be afraid, we're not supposed to have emotions, we're supposed to be the protector, things like that. Well, and these, and these are all side effects of an economic role. That's the craziest thing about this is that masculinity changes based upon what the economy wants from it. Like this modern idea of masculinity is relatively new, yeah. right? This this is this is a, uh, a, a an industrial age identity, right? Okay. Because there have been moments in time where the, the the ideal masculine was to you know wear powdered wigs and listen to classical music and be learned right right and there are other times particularly now in America where we are set up the the unsaid rules are set up so that we will go to a factory we'll break our bodies providing for our family we'll consider ourselves disposable and we won't complain mm -hmm. well. We're not in that society anymore. No. Industry has more or less gone away, and now we're living in a communication society. Right. We're living in it, and, and the, the, the really sad part about this is that men have everything to gain. They can live better, richer lives. They can have better, intimate relationships. They, mm. can, they can express themselves. They can live longer. They can live better lives. They can earn more money, right? Because actually, if you embrace so-called unmasculine ideas— you can collaborate, you can communicate, you can form relationships, partnerships, alliances, right. all these things. And so if we actually realize that we have something to gain, I think that actually gets some men out. You know what I mean? When they suddenly realize, oh, there's something in this for me. But personally, for you and the people around you, it makes a huge difference. And it makes everyone's lives better. But also, if you want to look at it selfishly, it makes your life better as well. Absolutely. And Yet there are, it's, it, that really hit me what you were just saying, like looking at it from an economic lens, it, it's, it's so true. And I'm always looking for where's the in for me to broach this topic with me, the men that I work with and the men in my life. And so, you know, that is a really good, you know, there's some good learning there to know that masculinity hasn't always been the same throughout our history it is it always it hasn't always been the industrial break your back right and we are kind of i think men um are are shifting slower than uh than the women in our society right we had mm -hmm. the 80s where women went back to work by and large and you know, things weren't different for men. They, we just kept working and doing what we do. And then the shift came where women were making more money and having, you know, higher paying jobs and more important jobs. And men kept doing the same. And 
now then we have this family unit where men are started to be needed in the home and mm-hmm. by and large we don't uh, we don't have the skills for that and so we're really struggling and it feels like i don't i'd love to hear your opinion it feels like we are in this existential crisis and we, yes. we're at a turning point and we have to as a society decide where we're going to go and yeah and the the problem the, the 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 big overarching problem in all of this, and I actually think politically there's a giant problem with this. Yes. Which is we we have a movement in this country, and again, I don't know where we're doing on this podcast or how deep you want to get into it, but there is a movement in this country that is based around weaponized nostalgia, which is the idea where like the world is changing, mm. and you are being told it doesn't have to change. Right. Like like it, th- this is against you. The, you. You don't have to change. You, and, and I say mental health crisis because it's like, no, the problem's not with you. It's everyone else. And don't you listen when it talks about privilege and yes. stuff like that. Yes. And and we have such a culture that's based on that. And by the way, that's not even just on the right wing. There's a movement on the left wing that we have, you know, movies and music that is just like, oh, the problem's not you. It's everyone who doesn't get you or whatever. There's like a narcissistic tension. Sure, stuff. sure. But I will say, I come from a factory family, a labor family. Mm -hmm. My family has been exploited for generations. And the men die in their 50s. If they get to the 60s, they've won. You know what I mean? If they get to a point of retirement, they've won. And then almost immediately, they die because they're not going to work and they don't have that push anymore, Mm -hmm. right? They've given up their hands, their fingers, their bodies. You know, my stepdad, I love my stepdad to death. He can barely get up in the morning. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, yeah. and I talk to people all the time where, you know, their labor defines them. Like they, they, they're like, you know, maybe I don't like this job, but I'm a, I'm a coal miner. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a factory worker or whatever. Well, you don't have to define yourself based on all of that. You can define yourself based on, am I a good partner? Am I a good father? Am I a good brother, a good son, you know? And and I think that once we start to realize that there's something beyond the self-sacrifice, because I'll tell you, and I don't know if you've run across men like this, it breaks my heart. They'll make comments all the time, Kyle, and they're like, you know, when I die, just throw me in a hole. Don't even worry about it. Yeah. And because that's all they see of themselves. They're literally just their bodies to go out and and do labor. And that is just, and they know deep down how supremely sad that is, but they push it down. And unfortunately, we live in a society now where people have realized that they can gain political power and economic purchase by selling that fantasy that, no, you really do love that job. You love going in the coal mine and getting black lung and dying at like 42, right? Yeah. Oh, no, that's what real men are. And we're bringing back the factories and the coal. And they're not. Right. Those things aren't coming back. Yeah. And what's more, you want to talk, and I, I, I made this argument in the book. If men want to define themselves as protectors, well, okay, so you're working in a coal mine. You're adding to things like climate change and climate crisis. You're not protecting your grandkids. You're not protecting your great grandkids. You're not protecting anybody, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, is your idea of self more important than protecting other people? And I think sometimes that short circuits the idea, mm. right? Like, oh, so you're protecting your your wife or your family. When's the last time you talk to them, right. right? Are you making sure that everything's okay? Because it doesn't seem like you're protecting them. And it's mm. it's those it, it, it's those hypocrisies and contradictions of masculinity that undo it because it's very fragile. There's mm-hmm. a reason why men get violent about masculinity, why they get angry about masculinity and why they overcompensate. And that's because the whole thing is a very, very brittle stack of cards. It falls very easily. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, as you were saying that, what, what came to mind for me is, you know, I've talked to, to men and when, when the when the topic comes about it people get engaged in it and it just has to be addressed it has to be opened up in a way that is not like you know attacking 
someone. And I think that's why the, the, the term toxic masculinity really kind of, I struggle with it, to be honest. I think it's a, a very incendiary term. And, you know, I, I, I tend to use traditional masculinity rather, and I don't even know if that's accurate, but it feels more, you know, like the John Wayne and the, you know. <laughs> um, well, and, and by the way, it's so funny you bring up John Wayne. John Wayne was a total fraud. I mean, like it was a, he was a totally like created personality right. and, and, and actually weirdly enough, if you look at the history of John Wayne, he was actually like abused on the set of his movies by directors. I mean, it, it's, oh. it's, it's really kind of a shocking thing when you look at it. And, and, and here's the thing that I always end up dealing with. People say to me, they're like, you know, when this book came out, they're like, Oh, you're trying to get rid of masculinity. It's like, Look at me. I'm I'm a white dude with a beard. I'm wearing jeans and boots right now. You right. know, if it if the temperature was three degrees cooler, I would have a flannel on. Like this is <laughs> you know, I I, I I I express myself outwardly in a masculine way. That's how I live life. I'm not trying to get rid of the idea of masculinity. I want to open the door to where men can express themselves however they want and realize that other people doing different doesn't hurt them. Yeah. So it's it's a really hard thing. The toxic masculinity label. And when I started writing this book a few years ago, I started writing this um, at the end of 2016 going into 2017. We really didn't have any other words for it. You know what I mean? Like I, and we still kind of don't because unfortunately our culture for the longest time has just taken gender as being something beyond, you know, investigation. Like we now have a such, and I wrote at the end of the book, I've been teaching uh, at the college level for, oh my God, 15 years. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so I've, been, I've, been, I've been teaching college for 15 years. Um, I didn't have my first transgender student until about five or six years into that. Mm. And now it's nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's just gender is now, especially at an academic level, it's just it's a fluid concept. Right. People can come in one day expressing one gender, come in another expressing another. I mean, my God, who knows how many genders there are at this point? Right. That when it first happened to me, I was like, oh, my God, what is going on? Like, what, what is happening with society? Maybe we're in trouble. And now I'm like, oh, my God, the freedom is incredible. Yeah. Like, it, it, like so. I think that we, in some places, we investigate this stuff, and in other places, we just really don't want to talk about it or investigate it. So we need a better vocabulary. We need a better language, and we need a better way of opening doors where it's not a political trench warfare situation. Right. Because because I'll say this. We, we've been talking a lot, but we haven't talked yet about how to make inroads. Mm-hmm. And just going up to someone and saying, your masculinity is toxic. That doesn't do it. No. It doesn't do it because right. the one of the biggest issues we have as a society is we're engaged in a cultural trench warfare situation, right. which means that when we sit down to talk about important issues, a lot of the times we're just trading talking points back and forth. We're just lobbing them back and forth like mortars. And yeah. it actually just makes the other side burrow in deeper. And I'll tell you, I've talked to a lot of um, – Former white supremacists, former white terrorists, former neo Nazis, they love it. They love this situation. These like, extremists. What's happening right now, you mean? The, oh, no, yeah. they love what's happening with this okay. crisis of masculinity. Right. Because they, you know, and the sad truth is they've studied Al Qaeda, they've studied ISIS. It's the same thing. It's when you have a group of men who feel impotent and powerless. And like culture is changing around them. They mm. want to join something larger than them that makes them feel strong right. and dangerous. And feel like and, they belong, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. There's a reason why young boys draw swastikas in public bathrooms, mm. right? They're flirting with something big and dangerous that feels bigger than them. There's yeah. a reason why fascism brings these people in. And if we are going to have a future, as a society, Mm -hmm. we have to start realizing that the things that people do, like joining fascist organizations or joining neo-Nazi organizations, they're doing it because they're not getting something, right? They feel alienated. They feel alone. They feel terrified. And we need to understand that toxic masculinity or traditional masculinity, whatever we want to call it, 
leaves men feeling vulnerable and like they need to overcompensate and be aggressive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a reason why mass shooters are men. There's a reason why all the violence is on the side of men. It's not because of testosterone. It's not because of any of this stuff. It's because men need to feel powerful when they feel powerless. Right. And so we have to start talking to men and we start have to start opening dialogues and letting them know that it's okay that they come up short sometimes and that other men know it and feel it. Because once you realize that this whole thing's a facade, the doors open up. But until then, you hunker down and hunker down and hunker down. And there's so much of an opportunity to become radicalized because of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you were just talking, it really does make me think, you know, about the the current uh, presidential race that we have going. We've got two very traditionally masculine men who are who are running for office. Now we've got Biden seems a little bit more empathetic and, you know, but he is still like, you know, wanting to do push up competitions and want, you know, like willing to go out back and fight if need be. And so I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, because I know that you are a, a, a political commentator, uh, what do you, what, and you're also, you've done research on masculinity. So how do you see, I mean, I, everyone is saying that this is probably the most important presidential election of, of our history. And so, and, and I tend to agree with that. And so I'm wondering what's your perspective on, you know, how much of an impact do you see this election having on masculinity? Oh, I mean, everything. I, one of the things that we're finding is that the Democratic Party and the left has just been totally eradicated in terms of traditional masculine support, right? And this is one of the reasons why Trumpism has the base that it does, right, is because it tells its followers, it's like, whatever happened to the old days? Oh, political correctness, that's just a way to, you know, make you feel bad for who you are. And I, I, I wrote in the book, I actually think Donald Trump is the epitome of American masculinity for this reason. Like, He's a total fraud in that regard. I mean, the man wears makeup. He tans. You know, he worries about his hair. And then the moment that he feels insulted, he aggressively over attacks. Yes. Right. And even if it's just like a momentary, quick little thing. And I, I, I said this also in the book. I think that most of us who have been around these men recognize this. Mm-hmm. It's like it's when you're at Christmas and um. um a family member, a man is like talking about how many women he's, you know, been with and how much money he has and how people respect him. And he's just boasting and boasting and boasting. And then he leaves the room and all of the women in the room are like, I feel so bad for him. I just, Mm -hmm. I wish that he could find what he's looking for. That's who Donald Trump is. Mm -hmm. He's actually a really sad human being, right? He has everything in the world that you could possibly ever ask for, except for what he needs, right? right? And I actually, I, I wrote about this also in the book too, which is, or maybe it was the book before it. Like, it wasn't enough to tell everyone, oh, the language he uses. Because... There are a bunch of women whose sons talk like Donald Trump and a bunch of wives who are married to people like Donald Trump, yeah. and they love them despite their flaws. Right. But but we actually have a group of people who, in this country, because of Trumpism, they're like, yeah, I'm aggressive. F you, right? Like, I'm a Trump person. Is that a problem, right? Like, right. Oh, are you going to cry for me? Or are you going to be a snowflake or whatever? And meanwhile, they're like, oh, does that trigger you? And it's like everything triggers them. Mm-hmm. Right. Like they're, they're, they're terrified yes. and they're insecure and they're hoarding weapons and they're talking about taking over the government and, and all of this stuff. And it's actually and this was one of the craziest things that I didn't know until I started this book, which is, again, fascism, authoritarianism. They come off as being strong. Their weakness. Mm-hmm. It's being afraid and right. being so afraid that you are going to overreact. So I actually think that is one of the great untalked about parts about all of this is we're missing the crisis of masculinity. And because we're missing that, we're missing out on like one of the main ingredients for why this thing is taking place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is. And it, it, it is this battle for power. Right. And the, the feeling of power. And we know that when you're, when you're experiencing, when you're feeling down or you're feeling guilt or shame, you, you need to 
a lot of people, your antidote for that is to feel powerful, which is the anger and the, and the, the rage and, you know, belittling someone else. So instead of feeling it yourself and thinking, mm, I'm not so, I'm not feeling so good about myself right now, I'm going to turn it on you and tell you how much it's your fault. And, and that's exactly. And by the way, speaking as somebody who has fallen into this stuff, Mm -hmm. right. And maybe there are some men listening to this who have suffered or dealt with this. Like, and again, I, I'm more than willing to talk about my stuff in order to try and open up and talk sure. and have dialogues with people. And by the way, if anybody listens listens to this and they want to have a conversation about it, email me. I'm at jysexton at gmail.com. I'm more than happy to have these conversations. Great. Men who are in situations where, like, the only way they know how to communicate is to, like, yell at people, right? Or they'll have a big blowout fight with their partner. They know in the middle of it that they're behaving badly. Mm -hmm. They know it, and there's a guilt to it. And in the middle of it, you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Oh, and then you just double down, and, and it just goes and goes and goes. The shame breeds more of it and men know it as they do it and that's the sad truth Mm. is there's so much guilt and 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 um self-harm and trauma involved in this whole thing that it just it continues to escalate it's a terrible terrible cycle right and if you don't take the time to work through it and to actually i think the big thing is to own it Because just like you said, I mean, I don't know a man who doesn't behave in some of these ways or hasn't behaved in some of these ways. It's part of being a man, right? It's part of, you know, uh, you know, being a part of our society. We're, we're, I I guess I shouldn't say for everyone, but, you know, for the most part, we all are a part of this. It's hard to be a man in this country. Yeah. And, and, and I say that, and and that, that sounds almost like men's rights sort of talk. But it's hard to be a good man in this society yeah. because I'm, I'm sorry, but you live in a patriarchal society, particularly a white patriarchal society, which means whether or not you have personal privilege, you have societal privilege. If you are a white hetero cis man, right? Mm-hmm. That means that when you're alone with other men, particularly other white hetero cis men, they behave badly. It's almost like they pretend or they, they're in competition with each other to see who is the most masculine and who can say the worst things. Going back to the Access Hollywood tape, that was Trump showing that Billy Bush guy, I'm more than willing to be worse than you. Yeah. Like, oh, you're a big man and you're objectifying women. Well, let watch me do it. Right. And it's this competition where they and, and going back to the Trump rallies, that's what I noticed is it was men yelling racist, misogynistic, fascistic things, realizing the other guy had gotten away with it, and then seeing if they could get away with more. So it's really hard to be a good man in this country. It's a full-time job, even mm-hmm. try it. Yeah, and yet, if you have these conversations, or if you're able to engage in different ways with men, it opens up the space for that change to happen, or just to own it and live a little bit differently, right? Like, that vulnerability happens with men if they feel safe to do it, right? And I think that's... We're frightened animals. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually exactly what you were saying about, you know, the, uh, that, that veneer of the snowflake, like calling people a snowflake while you are, like you said, while you're stockpiling weapons and you are, you know, like trying to enact laws, you know, conceal carry and all of this stuff is, it's all based on fear. It's based on the fear of losing power and control. Right. And so, uh, I think as men, we do, we spend too much time and it's not intentional most of the time thinking about power and control. Now, the people who are enacting laws and things, they're probably intentionally thinking about power and control. But for those of us with our feet on the ground, we are, we are not necessarily thinking about it on a regular basis. We are reacting to and following the patterns of our upbringings. Right. Yeah, and we learn, and we learn from the men that we were around how they control. Yeah, and and most men, and this is the sad truth, most men are taught how to be men through abuse. Mm. Right. There, it's it, and it's verbal abuse and emotional abuse and physical yeah. abuse. Don't cry. I'll give you something to cry about. Right. Being yanked around the 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 stoic nature of like having. I'm sorry, but like. 
every boy wants to be close to his father. And if his father is emotionally unavailable, you de- I'm sorry, you probably, you know, paid off a mortgage or two, like talking to men who weren't able to talk to their father. Yeah. Right. I mean, because it's this terrible, traumatic thing. Yeah. And it, it, it resonates and it doesn't just stop there. It becomes this socialization that we carry out into the world. We carry it into our jobs. We carry it into our relationships and our politics and our businesses. Right. And we, we, we have this model which tells us that you have to be bad in order to be safe and in order to have control. And that it's a trauma. It's an absolute trauma that, that you have to work through for the rest of your life to try and shed. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so deeply ingrained in our society that you will find people who are just resistant to it. And I think that is the, 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 when you hear about terms like toxic masculinity, if you're not open and curious about it, that, that, uh, that pushing back or the defensiveness is a fear of what am I going to open up here? Right. And you even said in your book, people who support Trump, it's because they see themselves in him and they would be going against themselves. The sad thing about Trump is, and, and I actually think this is one of the reasons why Trump is so disliked. I think it's because we see ourselves in Trump. Mm. I think when Trump behaves poorly and with him, and again, like, you know, we're, we're late in the interview, so I'll go ahead and lay my cards on the table. Sure. I think he's a really repugnant, disgusting person. But there's times yes. where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, God, I recognize myself in that. Yeah. Right? In, 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 in the overcompensation, in the, the terrible way that he treats people sometimes. I think that we all recognize the things that we hate about ourselves in this person. It just so happens that he's uninhibited with it. He's just, that's, that's who he is and that's what it's going to be and yes. he doesn't care. Yeah. And the problem is right now at this moment, and this is a bigger conversation, um, to start admitting the failures that we have had and the shortcomings that we have had. We live in such a polarized, politically charged moment that to admit that stuff during that trench warfare could mean you lose everything. It could mean that you, you are publicly shamed, that you lose your job, you lose your money, you lose your influence. And to even take your foot off the gas and think about things for a second, particularly during a time of artificial austerity, it right. could mean the end of everything. And so you have to juggle the difference between who you are and who you present yourself as. And under the constant duress that if you fail or if you open yourself up and, and are vulnerable, you could be destroyed. So yeah. a lot of these people, they look at Trump and they're like, that's the, that's the smart move. You just say, screw everybody and deal with it or don't. And, right. and that just, it, it leads to a lot of really, uh, bad, aggressive overcompensation. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it's, and it, it is toxic. Like I, <laughs> I don't think there's another, like you said, that we don't have a, any other language for it yet. Um, so I, I, I'm keeping an eye on time, and I, I want to make sure that we can wrap this up. And I am, uh, you know, as a as a therapist and as a uh, as a man who who really wants to. My one of my goals is to help people be more relational. And so I've heard you say some things about you know creating inroads towards. Uh, supporting men in masculinity and supporting even women in understanding that that the the masculinity. Uh, can you give us just a few ideas of what you think w- how we can actually make a, a, a difference in this world? Yeah, there's a couple of things that people can do. First and foremost is the people who are around these men, whether it's your father or husband or brother or cousin or whatever, you know, friend. We become conditioned to accept the stoicism. You know what I mean? Where Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all seen this. It's like where dad says five words all night. And at some point, mom is just like, well, you know, dad. And and it actually becomes sort of um, it's a self-fulfilling thing, right? It's like, you know, it's like, well, don't talk to dad because dad's not going to talk. Well, dad's suffering. Dad's lonely. You know what I mean? He mm-hmm. actually is. He And it, it probably eats him up that he's lonely. Um, talk to them. Ask them more than yes or no questions. And, and, and while you're doing it, 
if you start touching on something that is obviously emotional or that would make them vulnerable, let them know that, that if they are emotional or vulnerable, that you will not think less of them. Because in a lot of ways, men think that they are carrying out the facade for everyone else, right? It goes back to the protector thing. Well, you know, if dad is panicking and is upset and scared, well, what's that say for everyone else, right? Like, mm. I have to hold up this facade of the protector and the champion. Let them know that it's okay to be scared or vulnerable. And, like, in, in, even if they just sort of roll their eyes or whatever, after a while it takes a toll. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And and just continually try. Do not just let them live in their own sort of jail cell. As In terms of men, we have to be better friends. We have to be better friends. And, mm-hmm. and you know, you actually see these really concerning polls. I, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was when I was writing the book. I want to say it's like 65 to 70 percent of all men feel like that they have like shallow friendships, mm-hmm. that they really don't have friends that they can talk to. Yes. And yeah. and that that leads so often, unfortunately, to suicide. Mm-hmm. It leads them to feel like there's no other recourse beyond. And, and by the way, the, the act of suicide in a lot of cases is self-loathing. It's like, oh, my God, I can't even live up to what I think I should be. And my identity is destroyed. And here we are. We have to like you were talking about when we're at a bar, if we ever go to bars again, right. if you're at the bar <laughs> watching a game, it's not enough to just watch a game. Because sports, the reason why they're so huge is because they give men something to do and not talk about themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's true. And by yeah. the way, I'm a sports fan. Yeah. I love sports. Absolutely. But use it. Like, watch a, watch a game and talk about what's going on at the same time. If that gives you a crutch where you can maintain your masculinity as long as you're watching, you know, games on Sunday or something, totally fine. But do not have these wasted opportunities with friends. Don't let them just say fine. Ask them follow-up questions. Let them know that you're there and that um, it's not wrong to be vulnerable and emotional. Because we have to stop being we have to stop being the jailers in each other's cells. Mm, mm, that's a powerful analogy. Um, so how how would you so if you're if someone is listening to this and they are uh, more traditionally masculine, what would you say? How could they they step out of that? What would be one way that they could, uh, they could, you know, work towards uh, taking small steps to becoming more of a of a, you know, new masculine or uh, open. I would. What I would recommend to them is to think about some time in the past where they opened up to someone that they love. And they were honest with them, spent time with them, communicated with them. Maybe it was one time at Christmas. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like maybe there – because there are these moments where you can, right? There's like sure. a Thanksgiving or a Christmas and someone gives you a hug and all of that stuff. Think about the joy that the person felt. That was obvious that they were like, oh, my God, I just had a breakthrough with dad or, mm-hmm. or with my husband or something. Um, men who are married and maybe they're, you know, they're, they're partners and then don't talk or they, they're not able to communicate. You can have something better. Like you do not have to live in this this cell. And it's so terrifying. And, you know, I've, it's something that I've talked with tons of men about. It. They're like, it's always right there on the tip of my tongue. I always want to say it. I just want to get it out, but I'm so, it's just something doesn't Mm. allow me to do it because it's infectious. The moment you start trying and the moment you get freedom, it's unbelievably infectious. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're going to end on that note because that was really powerful. And and thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And I would love to have you on again uh, to talk more Anytime. about this or another topic. Uh, but f- before you go, I'd love for you to tell our, our listeners, so what's coming up for you? I know you've got a new book that came out. Can you tell us about that and anything else that's going on? Yeah, so I got a new book that came out last week. It's called American Rule, How Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Uh, it, it's, it's about more of this. It's about the mythologies that we get trapped in, particularly mm. American mythologies. Um, this idea about what America is and what it isn't. Our history, unfortunately, is a really big lie that has been used for a lot of control and manipulation. So that's okay. out right now. Um, I also co-host the Muckrake podcast if people would like to come and check out my political stuff. But yeah, uh, I'd love to come on anytime. This was great. That would be great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Thank you. (laughs) 
Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to leave us a good review and subscribe on Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. This podcast is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. We hope you enjoyed today's show. All material copyrighted by the Psychology Talk podcast. Music provided by the band Serenade. <laughs>